2 Corinthians chapter 13, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And we'll look at verse 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And we'll read verse 4. A lot of times I feel like it's very strange. A lot of times when I come up here to preach, I always feel like I'm running on empty. But maybe the Holy Spirit wants that so he can fill in something. Uh, Gene Kim needs to be empty so that the Holy Spirit can fill within some of those parts even more. I'd appreciate your prayers. Uh, today's preaching, I hope, will be helpful to you. It may not aim for you, but I do know this is a big need. This is a big need. Pastoring for, uh, wow, let's see, how long was it? 21, so 12 years, 12, no, 13, 14 years almost, yeah. So it's been a long time. I feel old, so <laughs> even though I'm young. So almost 14 years um, this subject, I think, is very needful with many people that I've uh, preached, pastored, helped, and befriended across. And I've noticed even for myself, this has been helpful to me. I don't know if uh, the Lord will really uh, fill or bless it or will really minister to you, but when you come to this moment in your life, I pray that you'll remember this message and it can save your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, we'll read verse 4. The Apostle Paul is a writer. He's writing to the Corinthian church. He says in verse 4, For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. The Apostle Paul, he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, how he was crucified in weakness. Jesus Christ, he is God Almighty himself, but he manifested himself into human flesh, took on the form of weakness on your behalf and mine. And because of that, when we live ourselves in the flesh, it is the same thing as Jesus Christ. Where he lived in the flesh and he went through weakness, it was through the Spirit, by the power of God, he was able to do something mighty and save all of mankind. We are also able to partake in that same power when we are going through weaknesses in our flesh. And I want to encourage the weak that God can empower you, that God uses the weak. And as a matter of fact, God loves to use the weak. The Bible mentions that God, the weakness of God is stronger than men, and God loves to use the base things of this world to confound the wisdom of the mighty. If you ever felt like you've been weak, have you ever felt like that you've been weak in your life, that you felt like you've hit the limit, you felt like you hit a dead end, that you can't do nothing more out of your life no matter how hard you try? When you struggle with a certain sin problem in your life, you, felt, you feel like it's a never-ending battle. You keep going to the altar, you fall back to the cycle. You heard so much great preaching. Preaching that should have been the last sermon where you repented and got right with God, yet you fell back into that cycle. And that's the reason why some people don't come back to church ever again because they feel like they can never break the cycle of addiction. They beat themselves up over their weakness. They feel like that they wish they never have been weak to begin with. That way they don't have to struggle with this sin problem. They want to please the Lord, but that sin is just too great that they feel hopeless. There are people with personality deficiencies. There's something about your personality, your character, that you feel like, well, I wish I could have fixed this, you know. Uh, I wish I could fix my brashness, uh, my shyness, or sometimes I have a big mouth, sometimes I just don't talk at all. I wish there's something about me that I can fix. A lot of times these personality deficiencies may burden us and we feel like, you know, if only I can fix this more so that I can make more friends, so that I can witness better, so that I can be a good testimony, so that I can minister to people better. I'm just too strange. I'm not normal amongst other normal people. I wish there's something about me that could be fixed about my personality. Perhaps some of you lack a certain part of skill. And you try your best to do song leading. You try your best to do preaching. You try your best to do teaching. And you want to help out the church, but you always seem to mess up on something. 
And Pastor Kim always seems to put a red marker on something. And when he gives you a call, you're like, oh, no, I, I, I messed up, you know. So always happens, always happens, you know. And you feel like that you just lack the skill. A lot of times you, you try your very best, whether it could be even the what you call the little things, job, school, or just befriending people. And you just don't have those social skills. You don't have the job skills. You don't have the schools in your study. And you try your very best, but you just are in a competitive world, a crazy world filled with capitalism, socialism, and human nature that's like a rat race. And you feel very incompetent, that you can't do anything for the Lord. You try to learn how to witness to people, but you just can't seem to talk right. And no matter how much you write the notes, how much you practice, you just seem to slip up. One of the worst things that can ever happen is you try your very best and you studied, you learned, you practiced, and you did so well, but you seem to still fail. That goes in the minds of a lot of pastors, especially when they start out in ministry. They can be even skilled and talented, but still mess up. And they beat over themselves, over their weakness. Sometimes people who don't come back to church, you sometimes blame yourself. And you feel like, I could have done a better job. I could have done a better job. A lot of times there are things that God requires or wants us to do in life, things that we want to do for the Lord, but we hit a bar where we just fear. I just can't talk to people. So I, I can't witness. I just can't seem to preach the word of God because I'm afraid of preaching to the people. I'm afraid to surrender to the call of God, to be a missionary, to do what God called me to do. I, I've been a limitation. I'm afraid. A lot of times fear holds us back from pursuing things, even great things that God has planned for us. Big dreams, but big dreams and big things are truly big things. And they can be very, very scary. New chapters in life can be very scary as you go from a single, uh, as you grow up and you enter high school, you have to prepare for college. It's scary. And then when you enter college, you have to prepare for work. That's scary. When you get to work, you have to prepare for family. That's scary. And then from family, you know, you have to raise your children. That's scary. And then your children grow up and you have to save money for their schooling and everything. That's scary. You want to rescue them from the prodigal life. You want to raise your children to the best. But then those are scary things in life. New chapters are scary things. We wish we had everything made. All the right skills, all the money we saved up, all the spirituality we need from God on high, and things can just go right. But we have to understand, no matter how perfect our world is, there's still weak human nature. One thing that we can hate the most is embarrassing regrets we wish never happened. There are things that we have done we regret never happened. There are things that we still do we regret never happen. You might be struggling getting along with a certain church member. You might be struggling to get along with your spouse. You might be struggling to be able to lead a ministry. You might be struggling along to lead a family. And there are some things that you messed up in. That's your fault. And you wish it never happened, but the damage is done. You're just too weak and you regret it. You might have anger issues. You might have fear issues. You might have a gossip issue. You might have a critical mindset issue. And then those patterns, those unhealthy cycles keep repeating. And that's why your relationship life with fellow people, your loved one, your family, and in the church, and even your walk with God suffer. Oh, how much we cry out to be delivered from this body of corruption and death. To be just free from all of this and this myth. But I want to tell you, those are the things that God uses for his glory. Those are the things that God uses for his glory. Those base things, those despised things, those things that are weak, the things that you hate, the things that you don't like, the things you wish never happened, the things you wish could be erased. God says, no, I can use for my glory. 
I can use what you consider trash and waste for something beautiful. You never underestimate the weak. Do you understand that? When you have a mighty God. That's my title. Never underestimate the weak. Let's pray. Now, Father, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood. Uh, God, I am so weak. But you've used my weakness a gazillion times to do something great for you. To you be the glory, Father. Do so again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Look at this passage. We are going to look at every phrase in this passage. This will be a textual sermon. The first point is accepting weakness. Accepting weakness. Now that's hard, but you need to accept your weakness. The first part of that verse says, uh, we know that beginning of that statement where it says, for though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. That's Jesus Christ. And we are to be followers of Jesus Christ. Learn from his example. So, we're going to concentrate our part, not Jesus' part, because we already know what he went through. Let's look at our part. And that's where we're going to examine phrase by phrase. For we also are weak in him. That's my first point. Paul recognized that he is a weak person. And he accepted his weakness. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. We're going to look what Paul states about people who have a hard time changing, even in their sin. In our weak states, we don't want to repeat a cycle or the weak or the base things that we're trying to change within ourselves, but you have to realize that this is who you are. This is who you are. Now, don't get me wrong. We serve a powerful God. And there are things that we did change in our lives today compared to when we were lost. Amen. Thank God for that. Those are great things. So I'm not downing that. God can transform your life. But we have to understand that even though there are some things in our lives we're able to change and get victory, still at the bottom core of your flesh, that old nature remains. And that old nature remains where the weaknesses still have to be in it. Old nature is not annihilated. And we have to realize, I am that weak. So if you made stupid mistakes before in your life, you have to accept that weakness. I am stupid. Not, I wish I wasn't stupid. You have to just accept it and say, I am stupid. If you're the type of person that's a loud mouth and cause problems through your loud mouth, you just have to accept that. Oh, I wish I can get rid of this loud mouth. No, that's who you are. I am a loud mouth. If there are things in your life that you messed up in your sin, you have to come to that fact in my flesh. I am a sinner. What well, Paul said, the chief of sinners. You just have to accept that that's part of your life. Now, I know that really in the spirit that the old man is dead to you and that you are holy and righteous and not filled with sin, but that's within the spiritual nature that God sees. When you look at the outside fleshly nature, let's just admit it, you're still a sinner. You're an addict to smoking. You're an addict to drugs. You're an addict to wasting time. You're an addict to negligence. You're an addict to lust. You are a hopeless addict. You just have to come to terms and accept that. That's who you are. Not, oh, I wish this was gone out of my life. And, well, even though God, the Holy Spirit, you yield to it and can give you some victories, that nature's still there. And you do fall back. Why? Because it's not eradicated. And you have to accept that. It's not eradicated. It's not eradicated. It's not eradicated. And that goes through in our minds a lot of guilt and a lot of fear and worry. Hopelessness. Well, what can I do to change my life? God is not 
lordship salvation, where as soon as you get saved in Jesus Christ, there's instantly a transformation and a change where the fleshly lusts are gone. God understands it takes discipline and time. Discipline and time. And because that old nature is still in there, it's not eradicated, you sometimes fall back. God understands that. God knows that more than you do. God gets his doctrine right when you don't get your doctrine right. God knows that more than you do. And you know what God prefers? Nearly every case of the Bible, when he wants someone to change and to repent, if at the very worst case that there's something you want to change within yourself, it be a sin that displeases God and it's something corrupt in your life, didn't you know that even in that very worst case scenario, that you want to change and eradicate, God prefers to be patient with you, to suffer along with you, than to judge you. Don't you know God prefers to give you mercy and grace and to wait, to give you time where you can get victory little by little. And even if you revert back to those moments, but he can still give you victories nevertheless in between. He prefers to be long-suffering. Not judge you. Not judge you. Nearly every case in the Bible. Did you ever notice when nearly every case in the Bible, when Israel has committed heinous sins against God, when individuals today in this world commit unspeakable crimes, that God don't send lightning down from heaven? In your life, God does not chastise you immediately. Why? He prefers to be long-suffering to you. And that's what you forget. You serve a God full of long-suffering. That's why you get discouraged, because you forget His wonderful attribute, that He understands the weakness of your sinful nature, and He's willing to be patient with you. Didn't you also know that God prefers through his own goodness in your life more than judgment, more so his goodness than judgment, he wants to see you change your life? Didn't you know that? That's a wonderful God you got. He wants you to enjoy church. He wants to, you to see the joy of his book. He wants you to see the love and the strength in the fellowship with one another. He wants you to see his blessing in your life and use those things to help you change your life, to overcome your weaknesses more than his beating you up, than chastisement, than judging. Really? In Romans chapter 2, look at Romans 2. That's why you have to turn there. You're not going to believe me unless you turn there. Read the verse. Verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. What's first, his judgment or his goodness? His goodness. His goodness is first. His judgment is after, verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of judgment. Do you see that? It's always his goodness first, not his judgment. God prefers to work in that sequence. I know there are times in your life, even in your flesh, you just wish God sent lightning down from heaven so that you don't keep messing up in that sin. But you know, even if you prefer that, God doesn't. God prefers to be merciful. God prefers to be patient. God prefers to love you, bless your life, and cherish you more than striking down lightning from heaven to get you into the right path. He prefers love more, not force. He prefers an appreciative heart to God to serve Him more than mandatory restrictions. That's the kind of God you got. Oh, he'll send you the judgment at the right time, don't worry. But for him not to send his judgment on you, show something. That means he's still showing goodness towards you. He still sees it as, no, you're not that bad where I have to strike that hammer. Can I repeat that again? You're not 
that bad yet. Where I strike down the hammer. Because I know that you'll change in time through my goodness. I know you'll see your mistakes through my goodness. You just need some time. You just need to see more of my goodness. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. If we are to think about even the very worst case scenario of God chastising you so that you can finally overcome your weakness and get right with the Lord, you have to realize that even in his chastisement, it's not something to be discouraged about. We get so discouraged in our lives when we go through sin and through judgment and when God chastises us and that gives us a guilt trip, we feel so bad and every time we try to overcome something, we go 10 steps down. And that eats us up. But can I tell you that even in the very worst case of God chastising you, God meant it as something positive. God meant it as something to encourage you. Not something to be sad about. Not something to beat yourself over the head about. You don't believe me, so we have to look at the verse again. Look at Hebrews 12, 11. Hebrews 12, 11. The passage on chastisement. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, look at this. Why would the Bible... Say something positive about chastisement. Okay. That we should take it as something positive. Not something to be scared and terrified about and feel guilty about. Right. Why would God say this is something you should have a positive emotion, positive perspective? It says, nevertheless, afterward it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Verse 12, wherefore fear God because he will strike you down. Be guilty and wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let, her, let it rather be healed. Isn't that positive? Isn't that positive? Do you even realize what God is speaking to you about? Notice that the passage, the author is saying, when God chastises you, he's not saying this is something you should feel guilty about. This is something you should get convicted about or discouraged about. He said this is something to be encouraged about. Wherefore, lift up the hands, the feeble knees. Be encouraged. Get your emotions up. Because God meant it as something positive in your life. Why? The chastisement is not to hurt you. The chastisement is to heal you. Okay. A lot of times when you go through like these bruised off infections and then you put the medication on, uh, it hurts. It hurts. When that bubble comes out, it really hurts. But you do know what that means. It's healing. The medicine is not intended to hurt you. Right. It's done to heal you. God's chastisement is done, listen, to heal you. Why? Because you bruised yourself with these sins. These are scarred in your life. And then God's saying, hey, I'm chastising you not to make it worse. The scars of your sin, I'm trying to heal it. Wow. Amen. That's why reaping and sowing is very separated from chastisement. Okay. Reaping and sowing is what you reap, uh, what you sow in your sin, you reap the pain, the consequences. Chastisement, it has pain, but it's meant to heal. Wow. It's meant to heal. Good. Well, I don't, oh, that pain hurts so much. Let me tell you something. It's so positive that you're feeling that pain because it's healing. Because if you don't feel anything, what does that mean? You're crippled. Yeah. It's really bad. It's hopeless. You lost that part that you can never regain. Wow. But if you feel that pain, that's good. That means there's hope that God can still use it. 
that God, that you can keep it, that God can heal it. And when it's healed, that means you have the strength and the ability to continually accomplish feats that might please God. You notice from that passage, it says, let it be healed. Are you the one healing it or God? God. Oh God, I wish I wasn't so weak. And that's okay, God says, I got your back. Even the very worst case in chastisement, let me heal it. You can't heal yourself. No matter how hard you try, God will heal it for you. That's why he chastises you. That's why chastisement is known to be out of love, not out of anger or spite. It is meant out of love. Thank God for the chastisement. And even before the chastisement, thank God for his goodness. What a wonderful God you serve. Now, no matter how weak and pathetic you are, God already has a solution planned out, a divine plan planned out 2,000 years ago, written in the scripture, that I already know how weak you are, so I have a foolproof plan to help. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. You need to accept your weak state and let God be the physician to heal it. Let him show his goodness towards you so that it can naturally stir up in your life to have more of an appreciation and love to serve him. Can I tell you, Christ knows exactly how you feel right now. I don't. People here don't. And people are so easy to turn to other people to tell them their darkest struggle. And if you tell me that, you tell other people that we cannot help your life and we might even look down on you. There are some things you should seek help for, don't get me wrong, but let's be honest, we don't say everything. And when we disclose some things, we have to be, uh, use it with discretion when we disclose things. But not with God. God, it's no holds bar, everything open, spill it all out. I already know everything, I saw everything. And with God, when you tell him everything you feel, God, it's a trap. I mean, he wants honesty. It might be blasphemy. It might be disdainful if you say it out loud, whatever you pray in front of all of us. But in your private time, in that private closet, in the middle of the darkness, when the black hole is about to open up, and then when the devils are just invading your mind and your heart, and all you feel is sin, and all you feel is hell, God is right there and he says, spill the beans, give it all to me. Oh God, I feel like I'm so much trapped in here and it's hopeless and your promise is not real and what the pastor said is not helping me. And God says, that's right, keep telling me. Yeah. Yeah. You can't say it here, but you can say it to him. Amen. Because God knows what you're feeling. Yeah. Something that we don't understand. God knows your history, what you were born with, the, how your biological limitations are set, what your weaknesses are, what you should do more for God, what you fail to do spiritually. God knows all of it. And he says, tell it all to me. And when you tell him your most honest feeling, and I mean very honest, oh God, it sounds like blasphemy, then just tell him that, God. I don't mean to blaspheme you, but this is my feeling. Understand, this is my flesh, how it feels. And when you tell him all that, God understands everything. You need to tell it to him. If you're sad about your weakness, if you're discouraged about your weakness, if you feel like you're in a hopeless place of no turning back and no preaching ever in this world will ever get you back on track, you need to tell him, not the preacher. You need to put your bet on him and not on a sermon. And you need to tell him and tell him all the dark stuff and say, God, just help me. Oh, I don't know about that, preacher. You don't know about that? 
then how are you going to argue against Scripture? I'll tell you what Scripture says. Hebrews chapter 4. And notice what it says in verse 15. In 15, Jesus claims, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Infirmities are your weaknesses. It's impossible. God can't feel it. That's what the verse said. Is that what the verse said? I mean, don't look at me like a tree full of vows. Isn't that what the verse said? It's impossible. God can't feel your weakness. God feels it, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He knows the hopelessness and the depression and even, God forbid, but it does happen, even suicide flooding in your thoughts the thought of quitting, the thought of doing something wrong. Yeah. God understands it. He feels that. No. God knows. Knows the feeling. He knows the feeling. He knows exactly what you're feeling. And you know what God says for you to do with that? Verse 16, let us therefore pray with reverence. Is that what verse 16 said? Let us therefore pray. Come boldly, boldly, boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Oh God, don't you feel like that? I just need mercy. Yes. I just need grace. I'm in a black hole and God, there's no way out. No one understands. The pastor can't help me. No one in this church understands. Not even my spouse can help me. Oh God, I'm trapped. And God says, then tell me, come to me boldly. If you need mercy, come to him. Yes. But boldly too. He yes. says boldly, boldly, boldly. Oh, it's just so irreverent. It's just so hard. And no, you need to tell him that. Yes. You know what, what Christ wants? All your weaknesses, not some. God wants to hear all your weakness. Your problem is your refusal to accept your weakness. Okay. Let's be honest. Yes, you have a complaining attitude against God. Yes, you have bitterness against people in the church. Yes, you have some fears that you are ashamed about and that you're trying to overcome. Let's just be honest. You are sin. You have a hard time accepting that. You need to accept that and tell God, this is how I feel. Now, if you can't say it, then just look at Job. Look at the psalmist. Look at their heart, how they poured out to the Lord. Jeremiah said, I'm never going to mention your name. But look at how God used him to write 50-something chapters of the Bible. A weak guy like that? A guy who disgraced God like that? Yeah, that guy. Because God understand what he felt that you and I don't understand what Jeremiah felt. And God knows exactly how you feel that no one in this room, not even myself, can understand. And you need to come boldly before the throne of grace and tell him your dark moments. And let God take it. You need to accept that. You need to accept that's how wicked and dark and hopeless your flesh is without Jesus Christ. Amen. You have a refusal to see that. You think that through your own might that there is hope. Through your own might there is something that you, I just need to try harder. and I'm just not doing good enough. No, you're weak. And you need to say, God, here am I. My second point is animating weakness. Animating weakness. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and then we'll read verse 4 again. The Bible says the next part of that passage, but we shall live with him by the power of God. You know what? Paul mentions that he can live in that flesh because of the power of God. In spite of his weak flesh, God can animate it. He can liven it. He can resurrect it. He can give him something worth living through his weakness. Isn't that a blessing? Notice God don't eradicate the weakness. God uses the weakness. God doesn't eradicate the weakness. God uses the weakness. God uses the weak things for his glory. Jeremiah was just a young lad and he looked down at his age. He says, I can't speak very well. You have to realize how much of a fearful thing it was to Jeremiah. Who's going to listen to a lad 
who will preach the word of God, who will listen to him. Nobody listens to him. As a matter of fact, the Bible even says no one listened to him except, except maybe three people or something. But God says, don't say you have a weak tongue. In Jeremiah chapter 1, God put his finger upon that weak tongue and used that weak tongue for his glory. Can I tell you something? God's the one that empowers it. God's the one that animates the weak thing in your life and says exactly that. I want to use it for my glory. Oh, no, not this God. You don't want this. Uh, this has to be changed, eradicated. And then God's like, no, 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 I want that. I want to use that for my glory. God uses the weak things. For his glory. You know, Jack Chick was a very shy individual. And he had a burden for souls, but he just could not talk to people. Oh, he would forever curse the day the way his personality is. And, you know, just give up everything in life because it's hopeless. He'll never win a soul. He became the world's greatest man that Christians look up to, one of the world's greatest men that Christians look up to in producing what the Smithsonian Institute called him, the world's most published author with chick tracks. I'm not good in talking, but God, I can draw. God, I can mention the gospel. God, I can give this out. And God used that little thing that he had in spite of his shyness. Yes, he used his shyness for his glory. If Jack Chick was bold and he was a great talker, we wouldn't have chick publications. God used the weak thing. God used something that's despised, disdained for his glory. You know, God can still use you for his glory, animate it, empower it, even if your weakness limits it. You know that? Yes, it's your fault. Yes, you limit God's power, but you still can't eradicate God's power. Barak is one example. Barak says, I cannot go in battle unless you go with me, Deborah. He's supposed to do his job as a leader, as a male leader, not entrusting to Deborah, a female. He's supposed to be the male leader and make sure to guide the nation of Israel. But he failed to do that. He was just too chicken, man. He's, he failed to be a soldier of the cross. But you know what God said about Barak? He's considered the hero of the faith and Hebrews 11. Wow. But he limited the power of God. Yeah, Deborah told him the honor would go to a woman, not to you. True, he limited it, but God still empowered him. He still beat Sisera. He still got the fruit. He was mentioned in Hebrews 11 as a hero of faith. Doesn't sound like a faithful man. No, God could take what was unfaithful and turn it into faith. Didn't you know that even if you think like this is unchangeable, my weakness will always limit it. I could get something better from God. Get something better? Don't you already have a great God who blessed you so much? And that's enough to be thankful and humble for? What a God. Look how God used you so much so far. Blessed your life, answered your prayer in spite of your weakness. Yeah, you should have done better. Yeah, you should have fixed it. But you serve such a great God that his blessing still outnumbers your weakness. In Genesis chapter 28, we get one of the most heinous people you can think of, Jacob. Jacob is a liar. He is a deceiver. God had to teach him time and time again, and he still wouldn't learn the lesson until God had to cripple him. So then he had to hobble on one leg. But you know what? In Genesis chapter 48, the Bible points out that Jacob said, God promised me in Bethel that he would bless me. He would make me a great nation. He limited, he should have limited God's power with his failure in his walk with God, with his sin, with his deception. But you know what? He still became a great nation. No other nation became greater than his nation. You know what that is? God can still power your life in spite of your weakness limiting it. Didn't you know that God can even accept your weak limitations? If you say, God, I cannot pass through here. I just can't do it. God can work something out. He won't go greater than that sometimes. True, there are times that you should have went past it, that you should have done better that you should have trusted God, but God can sometimes realize this is just his limit, 
his or her limit. And you know, I can still work something out. Amen. Didn't you know Gideon is such a coward? Why should he be a hero of the faith? And God says, all right, lead the soldiers out to battle. And Gideon's like, God, uh, please at least do this fleece thing. Make the fleece wet and the ground dry. Then I'll lead you into battle. God should have chastised him right then and there, rebuked him, give him like full messages of blowout, unlimited compilation messages and said, get right with God. No, God said, all right, I'll do that for you. I'll do that for you. And guess what Gideon did? All right, God, I'll lead them. Oh, God, I'm still scared. <sighs> Gideon, what in the world? No. God is all-knowing. God's like, sure. Okay. Gideon says, God, uh, okay, fleece wet, ground dry. Now do the opposite. Ground wet, fleece, uh, uh, the other way around. Will you please? And God's like, okay. And then Gideon's like, okay, I'll lead the army. You know what happened after that? He was still scared after that. And then God's like, okay, why don't you go to the camp, hear what the Midianites say. And when Gideon went to the camp of the Midianites, he found out that they feared him. He got so encouraged, he led the army. What's that? God is willing to work out the weakness with you. Amen. Not just Gideon, even Moses. Even Moses. You know, God says, Moses, all right, lead the children of people, lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, all right? And he should have been done. He should have been done. But Moses is like, oh, but God, and, oh, you know. Oh, but God, but uh, the people, they're going to ask, you know, which God that I'm speaking of? And God's like, are you stupid? You no, God's, God was long-suffering. He said, tell them the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All right, go lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. Oh, but God, you know, they're not going to listen to me. They need to see a sign. And God's like, okay, use that rod and then throw it down. It'll change into a snake. Oh, let me show you my goodness. Let's do a second sign, okay? Put your hand in your cloak. It'll become leprosy when you take it out. Put it back inside and it won't be leprosy. And I'll give you a third sign, okay? So just take the dust and throw it on the water. It'll turn to blood. That should do it. Oh, but God, I am slow of speech and slow of time. Just shut up, man! Get to work! No, God said, who made your tongue? I did. Oh, but God, I beg you, please send someone else. And God's like, you know what? I'm going to send you Aaron. He'll talk for you. Don't worry, all right? Now go. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? That's called mercy. Yeah. Amen. That's called grace. Yeah. And God's like, fine, I'll use Aaron to speak for you. You know what happened? Moses did all the talking after that. What's that an example of? God knowing your weakness, feeling, understanding it. And there are times... He wants you to change it, but there are times he's willing to be long-suffering, work something out with you. You know what your problem is? You never worked it out with him. You never had that Hebrews 4 moment of prayer. You didn't have that. You didn't be honest with God. God, I, have a, I cannot do this. I just can't. It's so hard. Will you help me? Lord, I, it's just, I don't know what to do. And you never had that moment. You never had that time of coming boldly and begging for mercy and grace. You need to talk to God. Let him hear you out and maybe he can work something with you. You know, rather than viewing your weakness as some kind of defect, you know what you got to look at your weakness as? As your strength. You need to try to see the strength in your weakness. There are times, of course, that the weakness, and especially sin itself, should be disdained and should be repented and changed. But a lot of times, because we keep thinking that way, we don't see that there's something about ourselves from our weakness that could be used as something positive, which is why God never annihilated it. You know, a lot of times when we think about, well, I just wish I can fix this critical spirit of mine. I, I just hate it when I'm always critiquing and finding stuff. You know, you ever thought about that? Maybe you're just discreet. Maybe that's just your personality. You're just discreet. 
You know what God wants? He wants you to see who you are in your weaknesses rather than as a curse, to view it as a gift what God can use. If God is not a part of that in your life, you have every reason to think of it as a curse, as a blight, as a weakness. But if you have God as a part of that life, you should see it, see it as something God can use for his glory. Because Romans 8.28 stands no matter what good or bad thing you do in your life. Amen. You need to see those things as something that God can use for his glory. When God is a part of that picture and takes your weakness, he can turn that as something as your strength. Your critical spirit, maybe the Lord can use that as something as for discretion so that you don't fall prey into vulnerability, gullibility. Do you know how many vulnerable, gullible people are there who just believe everything and then they had their lives a wreck? Maybe the reason why you didn't end up like that is because you've always been critical. Or, let's forget that negative word, you were discreet. You need to view your blight, your weakness, as something positive that the God can give to you. See, what God does with weaknesses is that, I'm not saying he just leaves the weakness there. If he does that, then you just mess up your life. He uses the weakness. So he handles it, takes your weakness and says, okay, and you know, you wish that thing was erased, but God said, no, I'm not going to erase it. It's part of the Adamic nature. Let me use it for something good. And God says, let's transform this to something good. Oh, God, will you erase it? Oh, God, will you eliminate it? If I do that, child, I'm going to get rid of something that can be a gift and a strength in your life that can be used for my glory. Yeah. I wish that critical spirit was erased. And God said, if I erase it, you'll become gullible, vulnerable. Let me hone that thing. It's just you don't know how to hone it. That's it. That's why it's called Christian walk. That's why it's called God guiding you along. That's why it's called making mistakes and learning from mistakes. It just needs to be honed, not erased. That's all it needs. The weakness just needs to be honed, not erased. And let God use that thing in your life. What you deem to be a critical spirit could be discretion. What you, get dis uh, what you get discouraged about your fear, you should switch it and see it as caution that God can use. What you see as something as offensive in your life and you're just offensive to people, rather than see it that way, you should switch it as, I'm just being bold for the Lord that God can use. Rather than seeing your decisions as unwise, I wish I could have made better decisions. No, you need to switch that and see that as God humbling you. And I can keep myself humble. I'm not a really great guy after all. Even in sins and even in negligence of spiritual things, you should see that as I've learned how wicked and weak my flesh is. And I've learned how to overcome it. And I can use it to help somebody else. See, no matter how bad your weakness is, you need to switch it around. And see, see what God can use out of that for your life. And if those things were all gone to begin with, how would you become you today working for the Lord with those strengths that you have? Every person that has beautiful strengths that have blessed somebody in this church or in other people's lives, they were mingled in through weaknesses. They came from weaknesses. People don't understand that. It's who you are. If I, how I preach like this is not because Gene Kim is a perfect man with a perfect record, everything's perfect in his life. Okay, ask my wife, I'm not perfect, okay? <laughs> if you think I'm so perfect. How he preaches like this is through unbearable weakness. And in regret after regret, he wished he could have changed. And sins in his life that he should have gotten victory sooner against. Personality deficiencies where he felt out of society, out of place. Where he felt incapable because of age or lack of skill or lack of experience. 
But it's because of these things God has used to have me preach to you today. No preacher on this earth ever preached a great sermon without experiencing failure or pain or weakness first. My third point is addressing weakness. Addressing weakness. Notice the last part of the verse, which is very important. Toward you. The weakness that he went through is addressed to people. Toward you. Toward you. Do you realize that your weakness can be used to address somebody else's pain? How can a holy, righteous Pharisee that people look up as, oh, someone so godly and holy, how can those people in pain who are suffering weaknesses rely on a guy like that for solutions and problems to understand? No, they just feel incapable. They feel unworthy. But a fellow drug addict feels more like relying on another fellow drug addict that understands it. The person who made the same failures in preaching would rely on another person who went through the same failures as preaching. You know, as much as this pastor wants to help out his students, I realize there are just things I cannot minister to them that a fellow church member is able to minister. Why? People need you. The one with the weakness. Yeah, you. They need the one with the weakness. That's good. They need the one with the weakness. Not with the perfection, but the weakness. Do you realize you can be perhaps the only person in this room, the only person in this room, who can help somebody out there that nobody in this room can minister to? In your own family? your own neighbors, your co-workers, the people you come across, and yes, even people randomly God, you, God puts in your life. You're the only soul that can address that person's weakness. You're probably the only person in this room that can, that nobody else here can do. You know what I would do if I were you with the weakness? We want to erase it and annihilate it but rather than doing so why not use it to help somebody out there why not use it to help somebody out there and minister to somebody's needs who is in a weak state and tell them how much you can understand tell them how what helped you that can help them tell them the discouragements and the negative thoughts you went through in your weakness that can minister to them don't waste your weakness. Use it to help many out there. Use it to help many out there. Use it to keep yourself humble, huh? Not think that you're perfect, you're right with God. Use it where you don't become impatient with people and say, you could do better, and then, oh, how much longer will it take for you to overcome this? No, use it to... Make you become more patient yes, with people. Yes. Use it where you can be understanding of the people. Rather than being so perfect that I don't get it. Why can't you just overcome it? No, rather than being that way, use it where, look, I get it, where you're coming That's from. That's good. Let me help you out right here. Most importantly, use that weakness to lead that person out of that issue. Rather than saying, oh, I understand the weakness you're going through because I went through it and leave it like that. No, get them out of that weakness. What helped you can help them. Yes. Use it to leave, lead them out of that issue. Don't leave them suffering in the mire. There's something you went through in your weakness that you can minister to other people because Jesus Christ on the weakness and infirmities of flesh to minister to you. And you need to do the same with other people who are suffering out there. You know what people are doing, though, with their weakness? With that weakness in them, they self-project it onto other people. 
get hard on them and say, why are you being like that when you're talking about yourself? They're using it as a guilt trip to keep inside and all the time they feel hopeless. They do nothing for the Lord but just feel guilt every single day and do nothing for the Lord but just feel guilty. What a miserable life. Imagine doing nothing but just feeling guilt. Instead, they use that to forget about their weakness. Listen up. This is important. Instead of using their weakness, they leave it there. Then they forget about their weakness. And then when they look at other weak people out there, they act pharisaical. Okay. And they rebuke them. They judge them. But if you recall back two years ago, you just, you're the one who suffered that same weakness too. Don't become forgetful and prideful okay. of your weakness. Amen. Use that to remind you. Use that to remind you of what a blight and what a scar it is in your life that it'll keep you humble, it'll keep you compassionate, it'll keep you loving, it'll keep you track on people who are suffering the same thing and get them out of there. You know why Jesus kept the nail scars? The scars are a reminder of his love and compassion on you. Amen. Can't you see that there are people in this room that, are, that God has been more merciful and patient than with you? Can't you see that in this room that there are people who live their life in sin, that were hopeless, that always couldn't seem to break a cycle, that there are people in this room that thought that they couldn't get the victory and notice how God used their lives and changed them. They became soul winners. They became preachers. They became ministers. They helped out people in this church. They were a blessing to your life. There are people, there are people in this room, my friend, who are living testimonies and can tell you for a fact that God is good, God is long-suffering, patient, and merciful, and if He can change your life and use your life, He can use you. Amen. You're not the person. You're not the person God has been the most merciful, the most patient with. No, there are plenty of people for the past 2,000 years that God was way more merciful and patient than you. And God used them for his glory. Amen. And they were able to accomplish great feats for the Lord. You're not the only one. You're not the special person. You don't, you're not the only one abusing his mercy, his grace. You're not the only one that's hopelessly repeating a cycle. You're not the only one that keeps failing no matter how hard you try. You're not the only one that keeps coming down to this altar and then just go back and then you just don't seem to overcome it. You're not the only one that's so weak. You're not the only one that's bitter. You're not the only one that has those dark thoughts that you're thinking about right now. Those dark feelings that you're feeling right now. You're not the only one that said those words that you've regretted and you felt were so wrong there are plenty of others out there that God heard every time every second and still shows a mercy every single day this wicked DNA should be more than evidence of God's love suffering towards sinners There are plenty of people in this room that God has been merciful and patient. You'd be surprised. And they can tell you for a fact that God will give you grace to overcome it. That God does answer prayers. God will meet at that time of need when you need it. And God will give you the victory. And he will bless you beyond your expectations. Can any of you remember that? 1 Timothy chapter 1, please. Turn to 1 Timothy 1. You need to turn there. You won't believe me unless you turn. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. How God is so loving, so compassionate and merciful toward the basest, the weakest, and the vilest. And we 
easily, so easily forget those are the same people he was willing to die for. Willing to give up his own holiness to take in the drag of their sin. How so easily we forget. That's the kind of God we have. Not an impatient God. Not a God who's so prideful that he doesn't understand people's feelings or weakness. 1 Timothy 1 reads, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Thank God it doesn't end with a period. That Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I'm the worst of the lot. Yes, Jesus even died for me. More than you, he died for me. A failure. A person so weak, pathetic. He died for me. The worst of the lot. Do you realize that you have a hard time accepting yourself of what God can do with your life? But let me tell you something. If you have a hard time accepting yourself, that's okay. God accepts you. Yeah. Did you read that verse? This is a faithful saying and worthy of all what? Acceptation. What a, what a loving God we serve. Amen. He didn't die for an elect. Okay. His pick. I'm going to use only these people. He gives that opportunity to everybody in the world. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He's willing to die for you. He's willing to love you. He's willing to accept you. He's willing to use you. He's willing to be patient with you. God knew, God exactly knew what he was signing up for when he died on the cross, when you received him for Amen. salvation. No, you're not too lost, you're not too hopeless. God exactly knew what he was signing up for. Yeah, I died for you. You. So if God accepts you, then who's the only one not accepting? It's you. You refuse to accept it. You refuse to accept yourself. Oh, I could do this. I could do better right here. I got to change this and I hate this about myself. No, uh, that's who you are. You need to hum be humble, be realistic. This is who I am. I need to turn this to the Lord and let him transform it into something beautiful in my life. Let him hone it. Look, uh, if, you have a tr if you have a problem accepting yourself, um, then do this, okay? Today, as you come to the altar, don't accept yourself for your sake, okay? Just do it for His sake. Because God wants you to do that. God wants you to accept who you are today as the song goes, just as I am, without one plea. God wants you to accept who you are today and say, God, this is all my weakness, my defect. Use me for something beautiful. Do it for him. Do it for him. He'd want you to say that if you can't say that about yourself. Every head bow and every eye shut.